you're recording. Uh, Secretary Clauser is not here, so I would go ahead and start without her. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna do a quick overview of what we're gonna to try to cover today. Um, we have um, uh, just transition reflections today from Adam Miller at DEC, and um, I'm counting on Jane to provide some context around that. Uh, we're also we're gonna spend the bulk of our time today really focusing on any remaining issues in the buildings um, section of the cap and the non-energy section of the cap. But we are holding a portion of the agenda at the very end, just to be kind of a catch-all for any other issues that, that you wanna bring back that you feel like you haven't had an, an opportunity to discuss together and you do want, uh, so we, we do have some time at the end for that as well. Um, we have at 2.15, um, uh, Dr. Leslie Ann dupinay Giraud and her team who have been working on the climate change chapter and you've just got that chapter. So she's going to do a presentation that, that gives you the overview. Um, so we, you're in a better position to, to discuss anything that you would like to see addressed in that chapter that. Um, and I think, and obviously we're, we're saving time at the end of the meeting also for our public comment period. We don't have a break built into today, but um, I'm hoping because it's a little shorter meeting than yesterday that we can plow through. Um, but if, if we get to a point where we absolutely have to have a break, uh, we can certainly do that. So um, with that, why don't we go ahead and I'll turn it to you, Jane, to do the introduction for the Just Transition Reflection. Thank you. And, um... I see Secretary Clauser has joined us too. So um, thank you for being here. If you have anything else to add, happy to give you the floor for a minute. No, I'm all set. Thank you. Thanks. So um, Catherine, um, as it, you were using an old agenda. <laughs> so my apologies, um, but Adam Miller, um, he canceled, had to postpone yesterday on us. And so we are lucky and fortunate enough to have um, Carrie Hankstenberg from DEC to step in for the first 15 minutes of the meeting. And actually her work uh, within DEC is really apropos to our discussions about our continued public engagement after December 1st. Carrie is the environmental justice coordinator for the DEC's work. Um, and DEC has an environmental justice engagement focused um, contract right now that is timed quite interestingly with the engagement that we will be doing after December 1st. So Carrie's here to um, graciously step in to fill us in briefly on the contract and answer any questions to tee us up for conversation at a later date on how we can coordinate the two efforts uh, and have them more closely aligned. So thank you so much, Carrie, for being here. Yeah, thank you, Jane, and thank you to the Vermont Climate Council for making time for these reflections. So I did, so I'm Carrie Hengstenberg. I work at the Department of Environmental Conservation, and I have been involved in our environmental justice work for about the past five years. So um, I've experienced a lot of opportunity for personal and organizational reflection. I put together a few slides to help you um, understand this contract that we're doing, but um, also as an opportunity for a reflection, I also wanted you to understand how, um, how we're approaching community engagement and um, yeah, how we got where we are and what considerations have gone into this work. Uh, can you see my screen? I good? Okay, I don't do Zoom that often. I'm more of a Teams person. Um, yeah. yeah, so when we think about equity into incorporating that into all of our decisions we're making at the DEC, it's, as you can imagine, fairly overwhelming. Um, but then we all also feel a strong sense of urgency that we need to fix it. Um, and that's challenging because a lot of the situation with equity and structural racism were centuries in the making and they're not easily solved by changing a policy or doing yeah. something differently, which I know you all know being on this council um, and not having that benefit of time 
Uh, but one of the things we've learned and really taken to heart at the DEC from interacting with some of our external stakeholders and community members is that we, we do need to slow down. We do need to be intentional. And we have to remember the people we're trying to serve and the people that we're trying to help and build the relationships necessarily, necessary to slowly and intentionally incorporate them into our process. Um, so with that, here's my why slide. Um, why is DEC undertaking this community engagement work? Um, one thing we've realized as an organization is we're excellent regulators of the environment. We follow the rules, we follow the laws. Um, Many of our public engagement strategies, though, are very dated um, and align with some of the original major environmental legislation that was passed in the 70s and haven't changed over time. So we're working within a mental model of uh, we can't do a lot of these things differently because um, as the executive branch of the government, that's not our role. To, to change these things. And we ne don't necessarily have the resources or the power, support, or time to do these things. And most of us who are regulators have been brought up in a system where the goal was always to implement regulations fairly and consistently. And some of you might realize that fair and consistent while it's um, a noble approach to our work, it's not going to get us to a point where we're making equitable decisions and really incorporating equity in what we're doing if we are treating everybody the same. Um, so we're doing this pilot project as a way to put some of these ideas that we all talk about um, with inclusion and equity into practice. And I'll say we're just biting off a tiny piece. So that's why we're calling it a pilot project. It's really to start wrapping our head around this. We had to um, start with some small bite-sized projects. So what we're doing is we entered a contract with the Center for Whole Communities, um, which is a nonprofit operating in Vermont. Um, and they have include other consultants on their contracting team, including uh, staff from the Rights and Democracy Institute and the Vermont Law School. And some of you may remember hearing about Rejoice or Rejoice, which is the rural environmental justice opportunity mm -hmm. informed by community expertise, which thank is you. a group of organizations in Vermont working to advance yeah, thank you. environmental justice. Um, so many of these partners are part of the Rejoice organization. Um, we spent at least three months preparing the request for proposal and probably another three months ironing out the details of this contract um, because we really wanted to be thoughtful about it. And it wasn't easy because it was outside the norm. So this is a pilot project targeted or tailored to outreach in three Vermont communities. Uh, we started off with a list of 10 communities we were considering and recently narrowed it down to three. Uh, these communities are both identity-based and geographically based. And um, we've recently made a decision on the communities we're gonna be doing outreach to, or at least trying to. Um, and those are, let me wrote down. Elderly residents of mobile home park in the Northeast Kingdom, the Bennington BIPOC community, and then New Americans in Burlington and Winooski. Um, another interesting thing to note about this contract is 30% of the funds awarded through the contract are being used to pay community members for expertise and participation. Um, and these community members <laughs> fill a variety of roles. Um, and it ranges in, in expense reimbursement from $10 for filling out a survey to up to $100 to um, provide an interview. Um, you know, one thing to note in this is there is a lot of risk and vulnerability for the DEC. We are used to having more control over our contracts and our processes. 
And by entering this contract, we're really putting a lot of trust in the contractor and the community members in that we're not prescribing a solution or even a path in this contract. We are letting the community drive where the outreach goes. So here's a really long list of all the different things that are included in this contract, but helpful to think about that we're utilizing a variety of engagement and communication strategies. So not just uh, a public meeting, but it could be a series of different events, focus groups, surveys. Um, some, we've heard that um, some people in particular, the new American community communicate through WhatsApp and social media. So it's piloting different strategies depending on the community and what works best for that community. Um, there's going to be coordination with the state on translation and accessibility. Um, yes, as I mentioned, incentives and uh, cash stipends, childcare, meals, and transportation support. Um, in the planning through all of this, there's going to be community liaisons recruited from these communities to help um, in developing work plans on how to do the outreach and then actually doing the outreach and writing the final report and recommendations to us. Um, so we're gonna be relying heavily on community liaisons and community members to support this work. Uh, yeah, we also would like to provide community members to the extent that it is helpful, um, help on how to participate in state processes um, and getting direct input from these community members on how they receive news and information, how they receive um, critical health related information like beach close closures, boil water notices, air quality alerts. Um, yeah, and then lastly, uh, getting input from these community members on our agency's limited English access plan. So here's a quick timeline. Uh, this contract started in July. Uh, we selected the three communities for targeted outreach. We are in the phase now of developing work plans for each of these communities. And uh, we knew when we were drafting this contract that it would overlap at some point in some way with the work of the Climate Council. So um, we actually wrote into the contract for the contractors to consult with the Climate Council um, as they develop these outreach plans. Um, and as you can see, the planning period is long because we want to be intentional and thoughtful and get all the right people at the table to attend these meetings. So between January and March, or June, July, you know, there's always a little extra time in there. Um, we're going to be working with these communities to plan outreach events and then actually conduct the outreach events in June through October. Um, culminating with a final report to the DEC. So the outcomes we're expecting from this work are um, some summary of key findings, next steps, and other things we need to do, recommendations for strategies to use as we develop our public engagement plan and environmental justice policy and work to revise our limited English access plan, uh, written summaries of the events and all the people who participated. And then the last check mark is really important because it is laying the groundwork for developing a network of contacts in these communities um, that we can revisit and continue to work with over time. The final report won't include though, these two big questions we get a lot is, how do you identify an environmental justice community in Vermont? And um, how do you, where is a statewide environmental justice mapping tool? So that's a very quick summary of what we're doing at the DEC. I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, also since this is technically a time of reflection, I thought, I would leave you all with a few questions to think about. Um,
something that's helped me a lot in grounding me in this work is remembering who you're trying to help and protect through the actions that you're taking. Um, so I would challenge each of you to, to think about that in some detail and, and be specific. And if you haven't actually talked with a person of a frontline community, that would be like a personal challenge that I would um, give to you over the next couple of months to find somebody in one of these communities and just talk to them and listen to them. It's important to remember that um, voices of populations that have been marginalized for many, many years are socialized not to participate and socialized not to speak up and to think that their voice isn't important or doesn't need to be heard. Um, so it's something you all can do with your power and privilege on this committee is to reach out and talk to them. Um, a, another thing to think about, a question for you is how you, again, being part of this climate council, build in the flexibility that we know is gonna be necessary if you really wanna get these marginalized voices at the table to understand um, how the actions can benefit them the most. So thank you for your time. Oh, thank you, Carrie. Um, and I really appreciate your your challenge in the in the reflections here. I know that um, members of the council and and the subcommittees have been thinking about that throughout, and wondered um, particularly if the council had any questions regarding. You raised the opportunity for there to be um, overlap and and consultation with the Climate Action Council. Uh, with the Climate Council, as well as maybe building into your public engagement process. So I don't know if the council members have any specific questions about how that might happen, or if you have anything you wanted to add about that. Um, I will add that Carrie um, joins us at, with the Just Transitions subcommittee now. Um, oh, and great. The Just Transitions subcommittee really is focused on thinking about how um, how best to manage public engagement specifically with this kind of focus after December 1st. So having Carrie's um, expertise and engagement there with us over the last few weeks and into the future is really critical to ensure that we maximize um, all the work that both the council is doing and DEC is doing to ensure coordination. Great. Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity for DEC and or a and R. Um, and the VTrans equity work that's coming up and the Climate Council's ongoing equity work, if there's opportunities for dovetailing there. Uh, I am sure there are opportunities that could dovetail there. I, you know, I haven't been involved with conversations directly with uh, VTrans and their equity work, but I imagine with the influx of funding from the federal government for infrastructure. These are conversations we all are gonna to have to be having um, statewide in addition to the Climate Council to elevate our efforts in this area, for sure. Great, uh, any other questions for Carrie before we let her go? Or you, maybe you're gonna hang with us if you, if you can, but um, any other questions or, or comments? All right. Well, thanks very much, Carrie. Really appreciate you um, stepping in and, and giving us the overview. Um, Thank you. That, um, that takes us to the next part of the agenda. Uh, and we're going to start a review of the buildings section. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a moment. But as a reminder, as we step through the, the revisions that have been made, uh, in response directly to your comments, both in October and then I think the last meeting was November 2nd. Um, we're going to go do it pretty methodically like, the, like uh, David did yesterday on the other sections, um, but we're going to focus on the areas where there's really um, the, the most important changes or substantive changes have been made. 
uh, and we're going to ask the subcommittee task leads to, to lead us through those, those changes. And then we're going to give you the opportunity, uh, the counselors, any opportunity to raise any remaining concerns you have. I guess the most important thing is, as David reviewed at the end of yesterday's meeting, this really is still, we're still in discussion mode. We're still in uh, uh, raising the concerns that you have and also trying to find a uh, resolution in terms of specific language that can be adopted in the, in the cap. Um, it's, we're not in decision-making mode, but that will come next week. Um, so as we're going through these drafts, I guess I would ask that you keep in mind that, that uh, this really is the, the, the last chance you'll have together to um, specifically be thinking about resolution to some of these issues um, and, and the language that you would like to see reflected in the next version. And then that next version will be the version that you're going through and actually making decisions on. Um, so I guess that's all I need to say about that. I just wanted to, if, if there was anybody that wasn't on the call yesterday or hasn't had a chance to review the video about the decision-making process and you have questions, I will do my best to try to answer them. Um, although this is, you know, I think, um, based on the walkthrough of that process yesterday, it seemed like everybody was pretty comfortable with it. Anybody have any questions before we start into the specifics of the buildings? All right. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so you have had, um, everybody should be able to see this now with the, the actual comments in it. And I think Christine Donovan is going to walk us through this, but you have had the opportunity, I hope, to both review this revised text that has specific responses to all the comments. And um, the cross-sector mitigation team also, the task leads also provided you with a table, a separate table that had your comments, uh, both verbal comments that they had they heard in the meetings, as well as any written comments that they received and their direct responses to those comments. Um, this is really the text that reflects that. And um, I want to um, just then turn really a turn it over to Christine because there was uh, a lot of clarifying comments uh, that I think were easily addressed, uh, comments that um, were just word changes. I think Christine's going to walk us through the comments she and Dave have addressed together uh, that are the more significant. Christine, are you ready to go on that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, and first and foremost, I want to recognize Dave Farnsworth, a great collaborator, and also Brian Woods from ANR, who's been a huge member of our team since around late summer and has been very helpful in, in implementing um, a lot of the changes in collaboration with Dave and I. And I wanna thank you all for the comments that you've provided. I think they've, they've been very helpful and they've helped us to sharpen our thinking and um, improve the precision of our language. And we hope, we hope you find it that way as well. So Catherine, it sounds like you're driving. Is that what you're doing? Yep. So if you okay. let me know where you wanna start, I'll just scroll to that place in the document. Okay, so I think, um, um, I, I was thinking we were going to move work through the comments table, but that's fine. Um, we're pretty familiar with this document at this point. So I think um, on the first and the summary statement of the buildings um, sections, there were some um, improved um, tightening of the language um, that we've made, but I don't think there's any substantive issues on this first page that we need to go through. Um, I think that's also true with the second page. This is when we're sort of setting the context. Um, that's also true with the third page. Um, it's really once we get to the pathway strategies and actions where there's substantive material to discuss, I believe. So let's pause right around here. Um, thank you, Catherine. So pathway one, as you recall, is, is one of our two pathways. We just put, advanced two pathways. One is to reduce energy use in buildings by at least 25%. And then the second pathway, which we'll get to later, is uh, reducing the amount of carbon or greenhouse gas emissions from the fuels used in our buildings. And then across those two pathways, we recommended just um, five strategies. Um, and the first one is 
is the one there's been um, a lot of conversation about. And so why don't we move to page five where strategy one um, is discussed because up until then it was just wordsmithing. And, um, and we have clarified um, the intent of this strategy, um, adjusted the language to be more clear, informed by the comments that you all have made and the conversations that we've heard. And um, the big piece of this that I think is worth shining a light on is um, after we have recommended that, that a target be set to weatherize an additional 90,000 homes by 2030. That would be on top of the 30,000 plus or minus homes that have been weatherized to date in Vermont. In some earlier versions, those two categories were grouped together and we messaged 120K. But what, we're, what the recommendation focuses in now, this strategy focuses in on now is the 90,000K by 2030. How we came to that recommendation is by looking carefully at the modeling work that EAN had done um, prior to and, and sort of coincident with the early start of the Climate Council work. We then have coordinated and collaborated with and look closely at the modeling work that CADMUS and EFG have subsequently done as technical consultants supporting this process. And we also looked carefully at the work of the Weatherization at Scale Working Group that's been meeting with a diverse group of stakeholders over the last year or so. And, um, and all, while each of those three sources of thought and analysis vary in their details, generally speaking, this is about the target that they're landing at. Um, it is ambitious. It is definitely not business as usual. And we recognize that and have um, sought to strengthen our language to, to um, uh, further and better articulate the types of sort of enabling activities that will be needed um, and the hard work that will be needed to be done to achieve that. So let me pause and um, because this is a big one and um, first perhaps ask Dave Farnsworth, my, Farnsworth, my ABLE team member, if there's anything else he'd like to add. And then I know there are several specific members of the council who have had and provided comments and questions about this and provide the council an opportunity to respond to this. Um, you know, I, have, I have nothing to add. Thanks, you did a great job there. Okay, thank you. So um, if we wanna drill down um, the action one, which would be on the next page, page six, is where we start to translate this strategy into actions. And the language of this action um, has been adjusted uh, since the first draft we all responded to. Um, and we've made it more clear that we're not asking you to adopt the, a report of the weatherization at scale working group. What we're asking, what we're recommending be done is that uh, an action be forwarded that says adopt legislative or administrative recommendations consistent with those set out by the working group with the goal of weatherizing 90,000 additional homes by 2030. So there were really at least two issues around this action before. One was, is the number 90,000 new by 2030? Yes or no? And the answer is yes. And then is it because the working group said so or is it because it's the right idea? Um, and, um, and it's consistent with the thinking of the working group, but it's come from reviewing multiple bodies of work and listening to multiple people who are deep in this. I also should note that I believe Richard Fazy is on, is on this Zoom, and he's been a key member of the Weatherization of Scale Working Group, as many of you um, may recall, and also is a key member of the Cadmus EFG team. So Richard, please feel free to chime in at any point as well. So. Catherine, is this what you were hoping to do? And is it appropriate time to open it up for council discussion? Yes, absolutely. That was perfect. That was perfect. That was great. Um, so I guess at this stage, the, the question for the council is, um, is there anything, uh, has this resolved the issues that you raised in prior comments? Um, if not, uh, what would you propose? And uh, that'll turn it back to the council. 
any council members have any outstanding concerns about the, the two issues that Christine's covered so far? Yeah, Sue. I, I don't know that I have concerns. I just want to explain, you know, that <clears throat> this is ambitious. We all know it. And I think I would underscore it is not business as usual. And it's going to require a lot more sort of actors in this space than uh, currently uh, exists. And obviously, it goes well beyond the weatherization assistance program that um, addresses low and moderate income. But you know, I think that's the point. I, it is ambitious and will require uh, a lot more actors in the field um, than currently. And so I just wanted to say that that's acceptable. Um, some of the folks who I work with are gonna be overwhelmed by this, but I uh, am not. I wanna just recognize we've gotta do it because this is what it takes and we're gonna have to think differently about how to accomplish it. Thanks. We would agree with all that you said, Sue. <laughs> um, Sue, are you proposing any specific additional language to highlight that? I, I am not. I am speaking because I had made comments previously, and I know there's been a lot of dialogue back and forth. So I'm just sort of setting the record on that. Great. Thanks. Catherine, if I may, because this is a little bit in response to um, something Sue in, inferred but not implied. Um, in carrying out this work, Dave Farnsworth and I have been very mindful of not beginning to prescribe what the right program design or delivery approach should be. Um, having been a part of VEIC, which runs Efficiency Vermont, for example, which is a program deliverer, um, I'm very mindful that um, uh, for this level of plan, um, we didn't want to start sending signals about how to effectively design and implement to meet this target, that work should be done in our view by program design and implementation specialists and experts, which we would not purport to be. So just, um, so we tried to bring this in at the appropriate level for this type of statewide planning exercise. Um, but that said, we're open to continued edits in the time we have remaining. All right, thanks. Um, so a couple hands up. Um, Sean, Chad, and then Liz. So Sean, oh, and TJ, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate um, the clarifications that were made and, and just presented to us regarding the 120,000 versus the 90. Um, and you know, while it is ambitious, I think if you step back and look at the numbers a little bit and dissect them, um, we currently, um, whether I privately or publicly in the state, about 3,300 homes a year now. And so between from 22 until uh, through 2030, we're already on pace to probably do a little over 26,000 homes just at our normal pace. And so if you take that off, um, you, you know, the 90,000, and then you figure out it'll take a year to ramp this up. We're talking about doing another 9,000 homes a year from 2023 to 2030. And I think that puts that aggressiveness in a little bit different perspective. It, it, while it is ambitious, I think it's probably a little bit more manageable than the first conversation we had a little bit earlier. And I think it's just about how do you strategize and, and figure out some of the real challenges to scale up that quickly, um, given some of our workforce challenges. And I think it would be might be helpful if we just added some language that, that recognizes some of those challenges, although this is ambitious and it's the right strategy, just recognizing that there are work, going to be workforce challenges and other um, probably um, material challenges if they, you know, that we're experiencing early in the pandemic, if those persist, that that could be a, a, a impact this as well. And, um, uh, but I think that's kind of the focus of my comments right now. So thank you. And Christine and Dave, do you want to give you the opportunity? Is I know that you raised some of those challenges specifically in the draft already, particularly workforce development, and that's one of your things that you're addressing. Do you want to comment or more clarification? No, I think that was a clear comment, at least for me. And and I'll, and we haven't referenced, for example, material changes. I I noted that in um, in the comments just now. So okay. I think we can beef up that language some. Great. 
Okay. Hey, Catherine, uh, this is Jane. Jane, maybe just before we move on, since there's a lot of comments, maybe stop sharing. Thank you. Sure. Unless people don't need to. Okay. All right, there you go. Um, all right, Chad, I think you're up next. Um, sure, thank you. And um, yeah, really appreciative of all the work that's gone into this. Uh, um, it was one of the first times I, I've seen it. Um, and uh, it's a lot of great work that's happened here. I guess my, my comment is not, it's, my comment is based around uh, an interest in including the concept of electrification in discussions around weatherization. You know, I think obviously weatherization and you know efficiency is extremely important, but I think that's also got to be paired with the concept that um, we need to begin electrifying our building thermal sector. Um, that you know we we can't essentially efficiency our way to zero, uh, and you know when we consider the upward price pressures on um, the fossil fuel industries these days, um, as exemplified in the recent natural gas prices that, uh, you know, I, I think it's just going to be very important that <clears throat> we, we continue to think about electrification as efficiency, um, you know, producing electricity, you know, on your, on your roof, in your backyard, uh, from local sources of community scale renewable energy um, is just going to be a heck of a lot cheaper and a heck of a lot more efficient than 20th century forms of electrical generation, which require, uh, you know, mining and drilling and processing and refining uh, and all the way to the end use point. So I would just like to see the council, um, you know, lean into the fact that weatherization you know, needs to include electrification uh, to really get to where we need to be over the course of the next 10, 15 years. Thank you. If I may, Catherine, just in response yeah. to Chad, part of this is the, the downside of going through a document line by line um, rather than presenting the package of ideas, but we agree completely with what you just said, Chad, Chad and we've tried to make electrification an important part of the weatherization approach. Um, but we can, we'll look at the language to make sure we're making that as clear as we possibly can. Thanks. Okay, Liz. I'm unfortunately gonna just uh, jump on uh, with what Chad said. That was, um, I, I was gonna ask where in the draft, we might as well get weedy cause we gotta, we gotta get there. Yeah. Where in the draft did that happen? Because I know we had some back and forth and um, I had given the comment in a couple different places that um, essentially what Chad said should be included. So yeah, could you walk us through where you believe that occurred? Because when I search for it, I'm not finding it. And the word electrification only occurs in that last section about water heaters and wiring isn't in there and you know a bunch of other things that I think are relevant for kind of upgrading our buildings consistent with our prior conversations. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do that right off the top of the fly right now, Liz, because um, I don't happen to have a printout of the track changes version in front of me. Okay, um, yeah, I'm looking at the track changes online, which are posted. Um, so maybe we could <laughs> follow up separately. The um, wiring language was in there at one point, because, um, um, and we've had a lot of track changes. So it may be that in the last round of track changes that somehow fell off um, and I didn't pick up on that or at least I didn't pick up on that. Um, Dave, but did our, you, sounds like Dave, Dave. Respond? Yeah, quick, uh, quickly. Um, under, uh, at line 219, uh, we write that, granted it's in a narrower context the electrification of energy use is currently powered by fossil fuels represent yeah no i i saw those opportunities that, oh yep I, I see those two mentions of electrification in the water heater but in the set of comments that i submitted in writing before you know at the last draft right. i had flagged i don't know three or four places maybe right. where the concept right. could be made for vermonters to understand yep. that building upgrades 
have to include weatherization as traditionally defined, you know, efficiency improvements, yeah. along with other upgrades to buildings that will enable the transition. And so, um, yeah, just um, yep. wondering where in the draft that was picked up because I don't see any of the specific changes that yeah. I um, suggested in the draft right. change version. You're right, Liz, and um, and we can change that. They were in there, but I think as the documents move around among people with multiple layers of track changes, that got lost. Okay. And so it's not great. We do not I disagree. Would... We do not disagree. Yeah, okay, we're not great. trying to suppress. I, I would that. echo echo Chad and and hope that we can in the final draft make that really clear throughout so that it's seen as one one strategy, not multiple. Um, and I know the cross cutting sector. I think. Uh, you know, cross-cutting pathways, the intro, um, I think picks up on that a little bit, but it would be great to have it here too. Thank yeah. you. All right, it sounds like that is a, a, a definite revisiting some of the comments, make sure that they didn't get lost. Um, TJ. Hi, um, thanks Christine and Dave um, and for everybody who's worked on this uh, recommendation. I think it's much improved. I just wanted to point out two things and I think people may have started to get to this in the chat. I just noticed it right before it was my turn here, but I wanted to point out um, one that progress along this pathway can happen not only by the number of homes, but also going deeper in homes uh, and you know, the 25% number that is the, the pathway, uh, reduce energy use in buildings by 25%, that's, uh, that's consistent with what low income weatherization programs get in weatherization, but is more than what kind of the market rate efficiency Vermont and uh, Vermont gas programs get in their program. So I think there's, there's kind of two pieces here that are um, being aggressive and um, rightly so being aggressive, but I just wanted to call that out that the recommendation is really calling for both. The modeling really uh, in terms of the language that was referenced in the background, the modeling as I understand it, you know, assumed the percent savings associated with historic in line with historical averages. So that o OEO programs would still get 25% and the, you know, the efficiency utility programs would still get 20%. So um, I just wanna be careful about that language where we say, hey, at least 90,000 homes. Well, that's, it's, you know, um, less than that if you're going deeper, more than that if you're going, uh, if you're not. And um, uh, I appreciate the language in the action being turned into, you know, clearly turned into a target, but I also guess I caution a little bit about simply just referencing consistent with the weatherization at scale working group. Um, I think that working group has done really great work, but um, it's not, I don't know if this council knows exactly what that working group recommended. Um, so for instance, there is specific dollar amounts that are recommended by that working group um, using a mix of uh, ARPA dollars and other dollars. Um, I think the number is um, recommending 72 million over four years. Uh, and there's um, references to clean heat standard carve outs, uh, the on-bill payback, which we'll talk about later probably, and just other exploration of sustainable funding sources. And I think all of those are um, really important avenues. Uh, that working group also talks about workforce and quality, um, getting quality employees in the workforce, not just employees, but quality ones. But it's, um, uh, anyway, I just wanted to point out what was actually in there for council members who might not have you know, read that reference document and to make sure that everybody's kind of comfortable with what was, um, what's recommended there. And, and I also do recognize that you do just say consistent with, so it's not necessarily that you're adopting those exact amounts, but generally, generally speaking. So um, thanks again for all the work on this. Yeah, so Christine and Dave, you guys specifically changed that language uh, using the term consistent with. Is there, I guess I would ask TJ if you have other direct text that you would you would suggest other than that language to if you 
feel like that would make you more comfortable or uh, wouldn't require everybody to have detailed understanding of what's in that work group report? Well, just generally, I think it'd be good practice to um, say what this council, if this council thinks that those are the four things that really need to happen, then they should say it in this report and say, you know, building on the work, you know, you uh, give credit where credit's due to the working group that's done good work, but also just say, these are the actions that we're recommending. And um, it's, it just, I think that goes for this context, but also I think there's others across the climate action plan that are like that. So it, all right, I, I don't know, Christine and Dave, do you have any, any response or any clarification you would need? Um, that seems going deeper than what we were thinking for the climate action plan. So for example, what if the right number for ARPA money ought to be 125 million? I mean, I don't know I don't pretend to be an expert able to recommend how much ARPA monies should be deployed to WX in order to meet this target at this point in time. And that seems a deeper level than what I would expect from the cap and what we've seen, the level of detail in other parallel um, sectors for this work. But. Right, I, I do have one recommendation and, and this is how, um, as folks know, we're, we're moving the energy plan process at the same time here and um, how we're thinking about it in that context is, um, you know, allocate uh, appropriate um, funding to, um, to meet uh, what the workforce capacity can deliver uh, or something that was phrased really poorly and inarticulately, but um, you know, just have it be, you know, the legislature should, you know, kickstart weatherization um, in the amount that the, the market can bear um, over the next four years and, and find sustainable funding sources kind of including exploring on bill financing and, and others. Um, it, that's, that's kind of how we're 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 thinking about it in the energy plan anyway. It would be great if this this kind of language would was consistent there as well. And Dave, I saw your hand go up. Did you want to add anything or get, ask for clarification? Well, thanks. I just wanted to just to point out that the actions that we're proposing under that larger heading that we're discussing here, it's our understanding that those are elements of what that uh, weatherization work group was proposing. So coordinating agency action um, on workforce development, energy and financial coaching on bill financing, um, tariff on bill financing. So that's that's what we meant. The, 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 the money that was mentioned, I think uh, that group, it's my impression here that they did the best job they could coming up with available funding that would kickstart this, that would jump things, get it going the next few years. But that's very different from what the modeling suggests needs to happen and, and very different from, from what we're recommending. Okay, I understand that point, but then very different, uh, your, your language there, very different than what we're recommending. Um, I, uh, I'm having trouble kind of um, marrying that with consistent with the, the recommendations of the, um, yeah. but. Just, I understand TJ, I apologize for not being clear. Um, the actions that we recommend are consistent with what we think that work group's done. They did not point out the amount of funding that's gonna be needed to provide the amount of weatherizations that need to occur by 2030. They provided some indication, Richard Fazy's on here, he can clarify if I'm mistaken. They, they provided some idea as to what could happen over the next few years, not what needs to happen by 2030. So to that degree, 
um, I just want to clarify what we're saying is consistent. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I wanna just kind of close this out, Jared. I saw your hand go up in the midst of this conversation and Sue and Chris, I don't know if you want to speak to this point directly. No, uh, Jared, did you want to speak to this point directly before we close off the? I just, I just want to thank everybody for the good work that's gone in. I think that the recommendation as it stands now looks good. I do think that, um, you know, just going back to the agreement and timeline that we have talked about first at the steering committee and then at the council of using our December meetings to look more holistically and carefully at what are the recommendations around prioritizing um, investments of ARPA and infrastructure dollars. I, I do think that it would be premature and inappropriate to kind of get to that level of detail on this recommendation here without having that in the broader conversation of what are, what are the options on the table um, what are the kind of considerations around cost effectiveness and, and equity and, and the parameters of those federal funds? And I think we should, keep, we, should, we should keep to that process and agreement that we're not identifying necessarily specific funding um, re uh, recommendations in this text. That needs to be a more carefully considered holistic process that we go through together in December. Well, thanks for that reminder. Yeah. Um, so let's... Tonight I, uh, yeah, Catherine, I, I yeah. know you were aware of this, and I just want to be really mindful that um, Leslie Ann and Jay both had teaching constraints. And so oh, it's okay. a very I, narrow I window to both be here. So, and we have time to come back to buildings and thermal after. Um, so uh, let's finish up on this exact point, but not take on any new issues right now. Just mindful of the next agenda item. Thanks. I didn't realize that. Um, so Sue, your hand is still up. Does that mean you wanted to um, weigh in on this particular issue? Yeah, I mean, I guess I just want to say and underscore how ambitious this is. And um, I guess I feel like I'm willing to endorse what we're saying because as I understand it, we're talking about a plan that gets us to the objectives of um, uh, decreasing carbon and I guess what I want to somehow raise up is who becomes responsible um, for meeting this. And I guess you referred to it, I believe, uh, maybe Christine did about implementers. You know, what is the implementation strategy? Because it does worry me the level of ambition, the challenges of workforce and supply and everything else um, about this, which doesn't make me not want to put it on there, but I do want to recognize that within our current model of implementing, it's not achievable. So how do we change that and what kind of innovations are necessary? I think that's what comes next. Um, so I just, I, I, I kind of want to put that out there on this point, that that should be recognized that there needs new sort of strategies than sort of the same program to advance. A lot more money isn't really going to make it work better. Yeah, thanks. I think you're right there. I mean, there's then a number of other actions that go to how, how to support that implementation, workforce development and others. Joanna, Joey, you see your hand. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'll, be, I'll be quick, but I, I agree. And I think it's very important. It is ambitious. And one thing that may get at that or help potentially, and it's tied to some of the things that folks have already raised, like Liz and Chad relating to thinking about electrification, I mean, I feel like, you know, a whole home slash a whole approach when we're integrating and communicating with, you know, when we're engaging customers, consumers, Vermonters um, in these conversations, I, I'm sort of hearkening back to people, some of you very well may remember the thermal efficiency task force from back in the day, um, which had a similar focus on the, on the thermal side. And one of the, the concepts in there was this concept of a sort of a seamless path and like working within the sort of network of partners to meet consumers where they're at, where they are, no matter where they enter into the um, conversation. Or, and I think, I wonder if embedded in your sort of financial navigator section, that concept of a seamless path that I'm just pasting, I'll paste here that language from that report um, 
ensuring that customers receive consistent consumer friendly services, no matter where they enter into the system. I see and support the financial navigator services, but I also wonder if there's a way to, because of the scale, the importance of the scale and the pace and the magnitude of what we are pursuing, that concept of to the degree that we are able to integrate services and utilities and feel for and can can do that and we can capacitize them to do that. That seems potentially helpful. Great. Could I ask you, Joey, then if you could offer specific language to that effect? Um, and you know, I think that would be great. And yes. with that, I, I think we've I would just say yes, and thank you for the really important work that you've done, and I will do that. And sorry to be late on that idea. Um, so overall, I'm hearing that everybody is uh, agrees that this ambitious goal is uh, something that should remain a high priority, and it's really just making clear that it's going to be challenging, um, strengthening that language, and that it has to be tied directly to the electrification um, and efficient, you know, generally uh, so the transition to electrification overall so that um, any, any language that could strengthen that connection as well that might've gotten lost in the various versions. Um, and then TJ, I guess I would just say that if, if you have specific um, suggestions on the, work, the workforce, I can't remember the WWG. If you have a specific language about uh, references to that work, then um, it would be great if you would do that. It, you know, just recommend that specifically to Christine and Dave before the next version. Um, and with that I will. I did did do want to make sure that we have time for the next item, which uh, and we'll have to just come back to this. Um, this is a section that you received um, and uh, yesterday, I guess. Um, and as I said, uh, we have Dr. Leslie Ann Dupinay Giraud and her, who's going to be giving you an overview of what she and the co authors have put together on that so that you have an opportunity then just to give her some immediate feedback. So I want to turn it over to you, Leslie Ann. Thanks a lot, Catherine. And can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Jay Schaefer from Northern Vermont University is here, as is his entire class. So welcome to the class into this space here. I should have thought about that personally. Um, happy Geography Awareness Week, everybody. And um, thank you for taking the time to, to read the things that um, Jay and I and our student um, Owen Polio put together with some additional assistance from uh, Ken Jones and Chris Campany and numerous other folks that um, I will omit mentioning if I try to go through, through everybody's space. Um, what we try to do in, in this particular section here, since it's at the very, very beginning, was to try and, and set the stage for um, what climate change means for Vermont. And we thought we would use a, a hazards frame because the hazards cut across various sectors. And so um, there are just a few pieces that we're gonna highlight from there. And I thought the best way to do that would be to actually sort of step through by looking at the figures rather than the text itself. Um, there's a word version that's gonna come through that will have the usual page um, and line numbers so that you can provide comments by line number like we've been doing with the rest of the, the, the cap itself, the cap draft. Um, that's on its way, so just FYI um, in terms of that. Um, part of the thinking is also to, to provide some of the front end context for the additional um, chapters that are coming a little bit later on, in particular, um, reaching out to rural resilience and adaptation, as well as agriculture and ecosystem. So if there are pieces that we can sort of cross-reference, that, um, that would be great. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, And like I said, we're going to start off by, by just sort of stepping through and, and focusing on the, um, the figures that make up the, the pieces that we've put together here rather than going through words by words. And so one of the things that I, I thought was really important was to set the framework in terms of um, putting the cap from an equity perspective. And so I wanted to lift up this diagram that was submitted by um, um, subcommittee member Judy Dow back in, in April that brought the Abenaki um, knowledge into our space as, as council members and really appreciated 
um, the ways in which we could think about um, our relationship as human beings to, to our planet and to sort of use that to center why we are, are trying to both mitigate and, and adapt to climate change as we try to become more resilient as an entire state. And then following up from that and following from conversations that I had with um, additional Abenaki elders and scholars, um, tweak this diagram that I had shown to the, the, the council back in July um, that, that helps to, to bring this equity lens um, in the ways that we're thinking about information and knowledge um, processes and all of those various elements in there. So that's one of the first diagrams. Um, the other piece that is sort of front and center is we can't talk about weather climate and climate change in the state without um, looking at it from a vulnerability perspective, without looking at it from um, a physical environment. And so that's why I'm sitting here in, in the JRP seminar room with a physio physiographic diagram behind me that sort of reminds us why certain parts of the state are actually more vulnerable, um, particular types of hazards than others. And so um, one of those hazards because of where we are is from, from winds. So, so Jay, if you'd like to um, step in and talk a little bit about winds, frequencies, and then um, some of those frozen precipitation pieces that are part of, of the physical geography of, of the state itself. Yeah, can you hear me okay, Leslie Ann? Yep, you're good. Great, yeah. So my role coming from this as a meteorologist is to try to understand how climate is expressing itself through weather. And what I'd like to do and making points on the visuals that I'm going to be talking about here are understand the baseline of what our climatology is. Number one, number two, understand what the trend has been. And then three, understand the projections and what sort of risks or impacts we might anticipate with this type of work. So figures uh, A through F, um, let's start with uh, A and B are basically a climatology of, of thunderstorm wind gusts. Every blue dot there in A is basically a severe thunderstorm wind gust that's been reported in the Storm Prediction Center database, which you can see pretty widespread. Uh, it's also a case of a tree falls in the woods and someone didn't report it, you might not get a report of it, but uh, we get thunderstorms statewide. Uh, B is showing the time series of that, of, of it, those reports, and there's an uptick in it, also in part because of things like awareness and social media and the internet, um, but you know there is, it's a little hard to get a lot of the inferences of that uh, with thunderstorm changes. Um, we'll come back to that as a high level summary of all these hazards and where we're going at the very end here, I promise. And then in C, what we see is a climatology of the frequency of high winds. Uh, just a hot spot map looking at areas in the state that get winds more often above 45 miles an hour. There's a strong relationship with terrain and uh, the Champlain Valley does get stronger winds generally just from uh, terrain funneling. Uh, just to highlight some of the hazards there, the valleys in the east of the Green Mountains do tend to protect us from the, the higher frequency of stronger winds. And then D is describing our average annual precipitation across the state. We have pretty wide varying precipitation in our climate zone and anywhere from 35 inches in the greater Burlington area to double that atop Mount Mansfield to nearly 80 inches along the Green Mountain Crest because of the effects of some of the terrain, the rain shadow that we see coming off the, the Adirondack Mountains as well. So quite a bit of variability there. And that's, there's a lot of seasonality to that. Uh, and also with uh, within thunderstorms or winter storms, it can be a lot of variability just spatially with that. Um, e is some based off of some really unique work we did with the electric utilities, looking at wet snow and ice accretion. This is what we see on average every year, how many times the winter season we might have power outage impacts um, from really big wet snow or ice storms. And you can see that the frequency there is anywhere from like one to three days, uh, generally higher and higher elevations, also east of the Green Mountains, and also a little bit more in Southern Vermont, as we'll see in some of the hydrology and frequency return, Southern Vermont is a little more prone to heavier precipitation events, including winter storms. Um, F is a comparison of December snowfall climatology of our climate baseline in the Cyan line is the 30 year period ending in 2020. And then we're looking at the prior 30 years in the yellow line on this and looking at it by a number of climate sites in the location. And what we noticed is that there has been some changes here looking at just for the month of December. Um, what's not shown here is that December has been and winter has been getting wetter and a little bit warmer um, relatively fast with faster than other seasons. Uh, Leslie, is there anything else you want to wrap that up with on this one? No, I, I, think, I think that was perfect, Jay. Okay. And there's a lot that's going to come at you here. We, we recognize we're trying to want a little bit more wide than narrow but we're trying to also hit all the things that the climate 
uh, Vermont Climate Assessment Report maybe didn't hit that we're trying to get to with impacts based on feedback we received here. All right. Um, want me to keep going with this? this Please. Is, okay. Uh, uh, graph A is really uh, illustrative of, of where we are, where we have been, and where we're going. And uh, this is based off of climate simulations looking forward and backward. Over the last 120 years, we've increased in mean annual temperature about four degrees Fahrenheit. And that increase in rate has been pretty steady since the 70s. And what we notice is that winter is increasing about twice the speed of the base annual other seasons, about four degrees Fahrenheit is warm since the 1960s, whereas the other seasons have warmed about two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and where are we going? Well, it's gonna keep getting warmer. And then the high end scenario, the worst case scenario, the high emissions scenario, very, very little limited um, global mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions is very limited is the red line and we get about nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer by the end of the century, whereas lower emissions, that's RCP 4.5 scenario, we're talking about maybe another four degrees of warming by the end of the century, All right? Um, and then B is looking at agricultural impacts a little more, just establishing a baseline with warm season temperatures, growing degree days are basically a measure of warm season, how what the temperatures are when you can grow your plants. And then this is just the climate we would expect the deeper valleys, the Champlain Valley, the lower Connecticut River Valley to have the areas where we're gonna have higher growing degree days, what was not shown here is that we have seen about a five to 10 degrees uh, percent increase in growing degree, say, uh, values. So the growing season just getting longer as the, the growing seasons, as it's just getting warmer. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Jay. So one of the things that we can look at with um, changes in our temperatures over time is what that means for us as human beings. And so some of this work comes out of the Vermont Department of Health in, in looking at those changes in, in temperatures and who is affected. So looking at it from a, a risk perspective. So on the upper diagram here on the left-hand side, we're looking at um, populations by age in terms of who's affected by um, high temperatures in particular. And so we're looking at children all the way through to teens, all the way through to um, individuals who are over uh, 75 who have particular um, challenges when it comes to, to heat. Now, some work that was done with the Department of Health and um, a postdoc at the um, State Climate Office a few years ago um, realized that warning for 90 degrees Fahrenheit was too high for the conditions that we see here in the North Country. And so um, the actual threshold has now been decreased to 87 degrees. So whenever you hear a heat wave alert going out, it's in conjunction with the National Weather Service. And so the, the map that you see on this upper right here is part of that climatology of the, the number of days, the average number of days that we get over 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the, the differences across the state really stand out with larger values in the Champlain Valley and across in the, in the Connecticut Valley, and then lower values in, in Northeast Kingdom. Some other pieces in terms of, of human health and, and challenges to um, climate change from that are also summarized in this table that comes again from the, um, the Department of Health work. Heat, extreme heat is one of them, but they, they also sort of broke this apart um, by vulnerable populations as a function of other types of, of climate change related um, elements, including waterborne diseases, vector-borne diseases, harmful algal blooms, for example, and then air quality and air pollution. So that upper part of the diagram shows you some of those elements. The lower part of the diagram is, is also important because it shows you the spatiality or the, the where on the landscape um, some of these elements occur. So whether we're talking about floodplains or whether we're talking about certain types of valleys or other um, locations that are near to recreational um, valley. So that's another piece in terms of that where is vulnerable as we think about adapting to climate change. Now, if we focus on uh, vector-borne disease and we look at uh, Lyme disease, um, again, some work from the, excuse me, Department of Health shows that tremendous uptake, that exponential uptake in terms of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, confirmed and probable cases of Lyme disease from 1990 to 2016. And when you compare that with some of that work being reported up to the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, um, in relation to not just Vermont, but other states, again, we see that um, Maine and Vermont really stand out in, in terms of that explosive expansion of Lyme disease um, being reported. 
um, in terms of, of mapped conditions between 1996 on the left-hand side here and 2018 on the right-hand side here. And so this, this map, if we blow it up just a little bit more, shows that um, change in, in the, the incidence of, of reported cases across not just the Northeast, but the Midwest as well. So some of the elements that we're looking at from a human health perspective. Now, if we switch gears for a little bit and think about um, moisture availability, we can do this in, in two ways. We can look at moisture excess or extremes, and then look at it from a, a, a deficit or low amounts of, of moisture in the system. And so some work from uh, Glenn Hodgkins and Rob Dudley at the USGS, looking at um, how much the precipitation has increased in the summer in this 1950 to 2006 timeframe. Uh, the convention here is that um, triangles pointing upward show an increase and triangles pointing downward show a decrease. And so there are increases across the board for the state, both in, in um, the amount of rainfall that falls in the summer and also your storm flow values. And when we think about what that means in terms of, um, for example, the transportation sector, looking at the, the ways in which the, the magnitude of these increases um, plays out, one, one way that we can look at that is the 100-year um, storm or the 1% storm at different time frames. So on the left-hand side, this is what the 100-year the storm looks like on a one-day time frame. And so the, the red colors show you at least six inches. Again, as Jay was saying, um, primarily in the southern part of the state. And if you look at it on a one hour time frame, which would be important for um, culverts and culvert sizing and some of the adaptation measures in that particular space, again, those values uh, um, predominantly large across the southern parts of the state, but you're also seeing them in parts of the Connecticut Valley and into the Champlain Valley as well. So that's on the, the, the moisture excess side of things. If we, we think about it from moisture um, deficit as well as excess, uh, this brings us to some of these diagrams on, on this page here. And so what you're seeing is um, uh, an index called the Standardized precipita Precipitation Index, where the, the colors that are, are yellows and oranges and browns show you drought conditions or dry conditions, and the, the blues and the greens show you wet conditions or above average um, precipitation. So you see that shift from Vermont being um, particularly drought prone to shifting towards um, higher amounts of precipitation, especially in this sort of 1970, 1975 timeframe. So we're, we're shifting towards more precipitation. Now, precipitation um, has to make its way down through the ground. And as it does that, it um, then translates into whether we have enough moisture in the ground to support um, sectors like the agricultural sector. And then that moisture continues all the way down to recharge our aquifers. And that's where we can think about um, conditions in our groundwater wells. And so what you're looking at in the lower part of, of this set of diagrams is this, this observation that is sort of characteristic of Vermont of going between dry conditions. So the, the, the lower this value is, the more drought prone it is. And the blue lines represent the highest that Lake Champlain has ever been. And so 1927 is um, a, the flood of record for the northern part of the state, where we had that tremendous amount of flooding in November. Most of the year was actually in drought. And if we compare some of these um, seven day averages for stream flow, again, brown colors, low values represent dry conditions, blue represent um, uh, wet conditions. So in the 30s, even though we had drought conditions from a, a precipitation rainfall falling, we actually didn't see a lot of that play out in, in the groundwater wells. And that's different from what we're seeing now in 2020, 2021, where we're, we're now starting to see um, record setting conditions, both in your streams and also in our groundwater wells. And the, the significance of this is some of these groundwater wells actually go back to the 1930s. So for us to be seeing record low conditions is hugely significant. So if you wanna try and bring some of these together, um, this is a diagram that Jay's gonna walk us through. 
Yeah, this is a best way to try to summarize the risks and the directionality of them. This is not necessarily commenting on the overall impact or, or severity changes of them. And this is based off of research that was conducted, that was funded by the Vermont Utilities to understand climate change risks, and also the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation to understand Stay. insurance Stay. risks in future climates. So the y-axis is showing us how confident we are through 2050 in the different hazard or risk factor here. And then the x-axis is telling us if we're going to be increasing or decreasing in that hazard. And what we know for the high degree of confidence is temperatures are gonna warm, right? Climate is warming, which means extreme heat is much more likely. 90 degree days in the next, uh, through 2050, are probably gonna be twice as more common as they are now, for example. But extreme cold is not decreasing as fast, but we're going to head away from some of the extreme cold. Average annual precipitation events uh, is, is, is increasing, not quite as steadily, not as quite as high confidence with that medium to high confidence. But heavier precipitation events are a little more confident and in increasing a little faster than annual precipitation events. So those one inch or two inch events in 24 hours. That rate of increase is about twice the rate of increase from the work that we've done of the base annual increase. Um, and that's, it's a relatively modest increase. The base annual increase is about maybe a half inch to an inch per decade right now of overall annual increase, which is around um, around like five to 10% every, every uh, 30 years or so. Annual snowfall when the climate warms is, is eventually gonna get to a place where it declines. Right now, winters are getting wetter and warmer. Our climate is still cold enough to hold on to a lot of that precipitation of snow. We're still gonna have more interruptions of freeze and thaws in the middle of winter though. Um, wet snowstorms is a risk factor. We, we see a pretty high moderate degree of confidence that are gonna increase as temperatures are also around the freezing mark more often during winter storms. And wind storms on this, um, wind storms we anticipate wetter and warmer storms do tend to have a little bit sharper teeth, so to speak, that the large scale wind storms will tend to be a little bit more frequent and uh, drought as well, as, as uh, Leslie Ann was mentioning. I'm not quite as high confidence about that because of some of the asynchronous factors taken into consideration. And then thunderstorm winds and ice storms, um, relatively low confidence, a uh, little dif difficult to detect where those changes are gonna go with, with current uh, limitations of the science. We do see increases in low end icing events. So the kind of ice you have to scrape your car off or a little bit of ice on the road, probably an increase of that. But big ice storms, uh, we think there's pretty good stationarity. In, in other words, not much of a change there. And likely with thunderstorm winds, there's competing factors with thunderstorm wind gusts moving ahead through 2050. Um, and then I would just wrap this up by saying, I know we kind of want a number to shoot, shoot at for this, but we have seen from the insurance risk and the utilities risks through 2050, our increased like risk portfolio, if you think about it, for the next 30 to 25 years on the order of 10%. Um, over the previous 30 years. It's not a 2x increase uh, overall. So our climate zone is, is relatively resilient and modestly stable compared to other places in the world. Um, Leslie Ann, did you wanna add anything to that? Nope, I think that was perfect, Jay. And um, just to tee up your last piece here, um, the last thing that we're gonna be sharing is some projection work that um, Jay pulled out of the Climate Explorer, which uh, allows us to see um, on a zip code level, changes that have occurred historically, that's what these um, bars are, and then changes that are projected to occur in the future um, going out to, to the end of the century. So this Climate Explorer website is a NOAA-based product and you're able to um, use this on a town level, on a, on a municipal level to do some planning by selecting whichever variable is of interest to you and, and doing this either on a county level or on a zip code level. And this is part of the climate resilience toolkit that um, is, is a piece that we can be thinking about as piggybacking on in terms of the, the work that we could be doing moving forward come December in, in bringing some of these additional resources to bear. And so this is what was used to create these final set of tables that Jay is going to walk through. Could you zoom in a little bit to that, Leslie Ann? So this is just summarizing our projected changes in temperature and uh, precipitation. And what we see right now in our the 2010s, our average statewide precipitation is about 44 inches, and the projected changes through 2050 
are either, um, depending on your climate scenario, about one inch or 1.7 inches. And we also see for all of this is that it's relatively uniformly distributed across all the counties. There are some subtle changes there. Um, but with the warming temperatures, or the warming precipitation or higher precipitation, about an inch, one to two inches over the next 30 years. And then into the end of the century, we're talking two to four inches potentially additional from our current um, baseline on an annual basis. This doesn't account for extreme events, which could be, are gonna be a higher fraction of the overall extreme events. All right. Um, and then temperatures uh, were around 44 degrees Fahrenheit, statewide average, and anywhere from two degrees to almost three degrees Fahrenheit of warming, depending on our emission scenario that we're on. And then end of century, anywhere from four to as high as nine degrees Fahrenheit, uh, average annual uh, temperatures increasing there. And then uh, days above 90, lastly, we average, if you just look at the statewide here, four degrees a year, um, but the, we're gonna be around five, add five or six days to that a year. So anywhere from nine to 10 days a year um, to 2050, or if we're at the highest end of this, of this the warm scenario, we could have 41 days a year, it's almost 45 days a year or above 90 degrees by the end of the century. Um, if there are significant emissions, um, you know, reductions might be closer to 11 additional days or 15 days a season. Okay, thanks, Jay. So the last thing is um, the work that has come out of National Census for Environmental Information um, in terms of the state climate summary for Vermont. This is um, the updated 2021 version that is gonna be um, offered up as an appendix um, the 2017 version is the one that's currently online, uh, but this adds the extra four years worth of data and it, it also takes us through some of the elements that are always important to look at, like the number of, of cold nights that we have, for example, changes in our observed um, temperatures, both in the summer and the um, winter. Um, Extreme precipitation is defined as greater than or equal to two inches of precipitation. And then it gets into some of the um, projections out into the future. Um, so it's a four pager that summarizes all of, of these bits of information. And um, we have received clearance from uh, NOAA to include it in our plan, even though it has not been officially released by the federal government as yet. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you, that was incredible. And I think um, what I wanted to suggest is that given we're, we're running a little behind, we, we do need to cover some more of the building section as well as non-energy um, and the fact that the council members are just really haven't had a chance to look at this and, and provide you feedback line by line. I want to test whether or not it would be, if the, the council members would be amenable and also your team, um, Leslie, and would be amenable to sort of receiving input via track changes and comments in the next Word document that you're going to provide. Uh, and then if we could take a few minutes here, just if there's really burning issues uh, or questions that you have, but that, that that would be the avenue in which you would get the real detailed feedback. Anybody, Jane, does that sound like a doable approach? I know that we need to probably provide a deadline for that. Yeah, I'm happy to hear comments from others. So don't mean to jump in front, but just around, as we're thinking through process, um, the comprehensive draft is um, due to the council next Tuesday. So um, with all updated um, documents on that day. So we'll wanna make sure that as we set a timeline to provide any feedback, um, I'd love to hear like the level of feedback um, that Leslie Ann and Jay are open to receiving and what the timeline would be to um, get that in order to ensure that we had an updated draft to include next Tuesday. So I'd love to know if we got the pitch right, if there are elements that are missing. Um, I would also love to hear a little bit more about human vulnerability, because I think um, that piece is, 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 is missing right now. Um, if there are elements that are just um, not there at all, would love to hear that. And also, this is a question back to you, Jane. I don't know 
what the standard is in terms of the length of the captions for the figures so that they can be um, self standing and explanatory. Maybe that's a conversation you, Marion, Jay, and I could have offline, but I just wanted to flag that. So there's really, um, you would, I guess you're, are you open to specific language or clarification questions as well, in addition to people identifying that, okay. Absolutely, because that's, that's the point of, of putting this out. And I think it's right. part of the pitch question. Um, I, I know I've heard one, one um, bit of feedback right now that it might still be a little bit jargony. And so um, to the extent that we make this completely consumable and digestible is what we're aiming for. Great. Okay. Um, Abby, you had your hand up. I just wanted to say thank you. This context is so important, particularly, I mean, I guess I'll speak for my own sector. Uh, this is just critical information to have and really places us in the context of the importance of the resilience and adaptation measures that have to come from particularly the natural, you know, I'm thinking from the natural and working lands context. And I really, really, really appreciated that you added in high winds as a person who literally lives on the fault line that you saw there um, and has lost five barn roofs to high winds sustained at 85 miles an hour. Um, I think that is something that we don't think about that often, but is definitively one of the things that will be absolutely critical to resilience and adaptation measures. So just really appreciate it that that was included here. And uh, I think I need to move from Southern Vermont. I guess that's my left. <laughs> <laughs> if that's your only takeaway, Abby. <laughs> yeah, that's all I got at the moment. <laughs> um, thanks, Abby. I mean, I, I, I think everybody agrees that this, you know, you haven't seen this before, but this is going to be right up front setting the context for why do we need this climate action plan? Um, I think it's do a great job. Bram. So, uh, just quick things. One, on the subject of the human effects of climate, which uh, you asked about, Leslie Ann, and I think it's it's worth pointing out that we have at least one program in LIHEAP to help with heating for low-income people. We don't have any programs currently to help with cooling for low-income people. And you know, as we saw with the heat dome in the Northwest, it can be equally fatal, um, if not more so. You know, the 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 programs we're putting together to uh, install heat pumps, I think could be married with a, an intentional program to provide cooling to the most vulnerable populations. So, you know, I think that's a, a really helpful to have pointed out where, um, where all that's going. In terms of uh, the chapter, um, so much good data, thank you. It, it was just uh, wonderful to see it all there. And, um, to have confirmation uh, that, you know, as a road biker, I am whining about the fact that it's getting windier and windier. And uh, it's nice to see that it's not just me whining, it's actually happening. Um, you know, I would say parts of it were fairly technical. Um, you know, I learned some new words, which is awesome. But, uh, you know, if, if we are aiming to make this truly accessible to a broad range of Vermonters, um, you know, we, we might, you might want to just look at some of the some of the words and um, the the you know the more scientific terminology. If there's a way to do that with sort of out losing without losing the accuracy and precision, thank you. Not a problem. Thank you, Bram. And I'm going to look to you to actually send both the information on the cooling um, pieces as well as some of the the word choices. Yeah. Anybody, as you're reviewing this. Um, in the Word document text, please do if you have any questions regarding terms uh, or, or explanation of those terms, make sure that you note that just in the comments so that it can be addressed. Um, so I just want to check again in, into the sort of the process and make sure that I um, everybody's comfortable with it. Uh, you'll be getting a Word version of this, I'm assuming by today. I'm, is that right, Leslie Ann? It, um, it is, yep. Okay, so you'll be getting a Word version, which you can, uh, as you have with the other documents, provide track changes. And uh, Jane, I don't actually know how that 
is logistically happening? Do they simply provide their track changes directly back to Leslie Ann and her team? Um, Marianne and I should be copied on them because we're saving all comments. Um, in okay. File. Okay, great. Um, and that has to be um, actually received and addressed by next Tuesday. Is that right? So Leslie Ann, when would you like to have those comments? When would your, what is your sort of drop dead date for when you have adequate time to actually address them? Well, now that it's written, it's actually easier to um, manipulate comments. The harder part was getting the text together. So I'm not gonna speak for Jay because um, his teaching schedule is a little bit more challenging than mine. But if we could get comments by, what's today, Wednesday? If we could get comments by Friday, we'll try and turn them around ASAP. All right. So that is, um, I guess I, I'll just check and see if any of the council members have any concerns about that. Not that we have a lot of flexibility at this point, but if not, that's the way we're gonna go. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, both Leslie Ann and Jay uh, for walking us through that and giving everybody kind of the big, the big overview and it's great, great introduction. Um, before we turn back to buildings, I guess I want to do some out loud strategizing about timing here. We're running late. We haven't finished buildings. We still need to do non-energy and we still wanted that catch all at the end in public comments. Um, I don't... It, you know, I don't know what the appetite is for folks to go a little longer if needed today. Um, could, is there a, could I get kind of a, a sense of the group or Jane, if you have an, an alternative suggestion for how we might need to uh, try to tackle all of this and still get it all done in time. But that would be my suggestion is just keep going today for at least another 30 minutes or so, because that's about how far we are behind. I don't have a sense of how many outstanding issues there are um, beyond um, once we get through non-energy and buildings. So my only suggestion would be before we test even staying late is if we got a sense for how many counselors have outstanding issues, um, gaps or questions on other components of the work that haven't been brought up yet. Because if there aren't many, um, we might not need the time anyway, so we can just focus. Well, and actually, I think the task leads might be able to summarize that pretty quickly. Um, so, Christine, I know you have a couple more things you wanted to cover in buildings. Uh, and that, do you want to just hit those? Tell us what those are so we have a sense of how much more we have to go there. Um, well, from our, I was going to focus, we were going to focus next, I think, on um, just some clarifications around the clean heat standard. Mm -hmm. But there may be other issues on the minds of counselors that I wouldn't necessarily be privy to at this moment. Uh, so we've covered weatherization. Um, and so I think there are a number of actions under weatherization that were really addressing the implementation process. And the other big pathway was the clean heat standard. And so um, anything beyond the clean heat standard that others want to bring up under buildings. And while folks are thinking about that, I, there, there's there been a fair amount of activity in the chat and there have been some comments and, and also I just, I got an, we got another set of um, comments which is super helpful from Secretary Moore, um, which affects some of the language in the weatherization section. So those are live, we just got them real time. We haven't had a chance to absorb them as a group, but um, be sure that we're capturing them and those will have edits reflecting them probably by the end of the day tomorrow or Friday based on what the schedule looks like. Okay. Yeah, and I see you've been addressing some other comments like uh, Sarah Phillips has, had given you comments and you've addressed those in the chat. So I, that's helpful. Um, I'm seeing already that a couple of people have to leave at four. So um, maybe Jane, <laughs> we just keep plowing through. And if we get to four, we have to come up with a, a plan B for addressing what might still be outstanding. 
Um, I, I very much think that we need to do non-energy today. So I'd yeah. like to ask that, and because it's our second day with buildings, let's let's spend five more minutes and try to be focused, and then um, shift to non-energy. Okay. And do we know? To, do we have Peter available at the stage? I know he was driving. Uh, I see his phone number. I'm, Peter, I'm available. You're available. Okay. Well, then we're let's do that. Let's try to keep moving through. The rest of buildings wrap that up as quickly as possible and then we'll move over to you peter so christine do you need the draft uh or do you want to do would you like me to bring back the draft i don't need it but it's whatever works for the counselors um i think the um the main thing is you know there are wording changes that we have made informed by the comments that we've received before in the language that finishes out the first pathway about increasing energy efficiency in buildings. And we've documented that, Brian really documented that very thoroughly in our comments table. So I don't feel like we need to necessarily talk through that. If you're wondering what we did in response to your specific comment, the short way to find that answer is going to our comments table because Brian was very thorough in matching the two together. So, um, right. That would bring us, I think, for purposes of five minutes or less to pathway number two, our second of two pathways, reducing building related carbon emissions by reducing the carbon contents of the fuel they, they use. And the huge driver in that is our option one recommendation that um, Vermont adopt a legislation authorizing the PUC to administer a clean heat standard. And so that's nothing new, um, the language may be slightly precise from before, but I, I don't think there's been much confusion that that's what we've been suggesting for a very long time. I think from my point of view, something that's become ever more clear and has been made more clear in the language um, is, are two points. One, what Rich Coward has been very good about reminding us of and which we're still trying to be better at in our writing that, um, the weatherization at scale and the clean heat standard, both of which are market moving initiatives, um, are complementary and go together as a package. And they help each other be better at what they achieve. So it's not an either or a la carte. It's very, you know, and we won't, the modeling confirms, we won't achieve what we need to achieve for the building sector if we don't do both. So um, we, I just wanted to reemphasize that. And this speaks also to the, um, um, the interplay between electrification and fuel switching as part of weatherization work. Um, the other is about a detail about the clean heat standard because oftentimes we see a list of what fuels will be eligible, would you know be intended to be eligible um, for um, actions to help meet the clean heat standard once it's established, but we don't always remember that energy efficiency and weatherization are anticipated to be eligible as well. And we've made that much more clear in the language than before. And in my mind, that's hugely important because that also reminds us that the funding mechanism that the clean heat standard starts to create once the market is moving in that direction um, can help support the work that will be needed to achieve the energy efficiency slash weatherization goal. Um, so other than getting into the weeds about exactly what sentences we added to respond to each of your comments, which we did try and earn us to do. And I did find Liz while we were, um, I did find the language that was in, wasn't was in, then was in and got lost, it'll get back in. Um, um, I think we had about five colors going in the track changes at one point. <laughs> um, so th that's what I thought we should finish talking, you know, be sure to focus on and let me switch it over to Dave and Barnesworth and see if there's anything else you want to elevate. No, thanks, uh, Christina. I think you covered it really nicely. Thank you. So I guess it's over to the council if they have any comments or thoughts or concerns about that other major driver, the clean heat standard. Yeah, hopefully you've all seen how all your comments have been specifically addressed. And so the question is, is there anything still outstanding that you wanna bring up now? Um, okay, uh, Secretary Moore. 
Sure. I just, I, and I, this is in the comments I just sent in, Christine, but just, I think it's important to give a, a sense for the timeline for the implementation of a clean heat standard, not just legislative action. I think that the, that appropriately managing expectations that this is a pretty significant undertaking and isn't something that'll be sort of ready to roll at the end of the legislative session um, will be important for public readers and potentially, frankly, some of the, the legislative readers as well. And I, I don't know exactly what that timeline is, but I, I, I believe it's probably a period of 12 to 18 or 24 or even more months. Thank you. So that sounds doable. Um, TJ. I, I don't wanna take tons of time on this, but it's not clear to me what exactly is meant by the Energy Code Circuit Rider Initiative. And as it's been described to me previously, and I, and I don't believe this was in the previous draft, um, it, but it's it's kind of a way to get to enforcement of codes, which um, you know, having our new buildings built to, um, to code is really important as we, as we go forward and we know we don't have enforcement and that's causing a problem in the residential sector specifically. But um, to the extent that this is effectively um, a code enforcement recommendation, I, I'm not sure that that has been really fully vetted and I, uh, maybe it's just my lack of un understanding and we can take it offline, but um, I just wanted to throw that out there um, publicly. So I, I can follow up, I, I don't need a response right now and I can follow up with either Dave or Christine offline. Okay. Uh, that's fine, I, I just, one thing I would wanna say is that this has been part of our package since June. Um, it came up through some of the most specific public engagement feedback that we've gotten um, and through AIA Vermont and ha and um, so it's part of what we heard <laughs> listening to others saying what they know from their communities would really make a difference and is urgent to address at this point in time, um, which has been a filter that we've been using and been asked to use. So um, I would, would um, need, to, I think we would need to be specifically directed to take it out at this point because um, because it's it's been, I mean, we haven't, as I said, we've had two pathways, five strategies and nine actions. And this has been one of them all the way along. Yeah, my apologies. I didn't I didn't uh, realize that this had been in there previously and, and perhaps it's just the, the devil's in the details of, and I'll, I'll do a little more work on this and, and reach out. Thanks, Thank TJ. Yeah, TJ, I'd also recommend talking to Chris Campany about it. Uh, this is something he's been recommending. It was sort of based, it was based on what the Department of Public Service, a, a position that the Department of Public Service had for a long time. Stuart Sloat was the one person who, you know, picture him getting on his horse, going around the state, showing up at the work site to make sure that, that codes are being enforced. It was. It was very effective given it was just one guy and, and we're just suggesting that that be expanded a bit. So it sounds like TJ, if you, after reading reading it again, uh, if you have any uh, questions or cl for clarification, you'll go directly to the task leads, Chris Campany and other folks, right? Okay, good. Um, any other, just one last call for any other comments on clean heat standard before we move on? All right. Thank you. That was very quick. And thanks, Christine and Dave, for all your hard work in addressing all the comments you've gotten to date. And um, I've already kind of reviewed what you're, I've been taking notes, which I'll share with you, but um, of each of the issues that have been brought up and the agreement of how to, how to resolve them. So um, I'll share that with you afterwards, but uh, it sounds like we are pretty much on track for getting a revised uh, version with just some pretty minor changes. Um, by the deadline. All right, great. Um, so let's turn to Peter and non-energy. Um, 
And Peter, I'll take your direction. If you think it would be helpful to share my screen and to share them the specific language, or you would just like to walk through the this particular comments that you think are most significant that need to be explained that you've addressed. I uh, I do think the language is helpful. Okay. Um, and so if you could pull that up, Catherine, that would be wonderful. I will do that. And I'm going to apologize to everybody for driving while she's pulling that up. I will bemoan the fact that driving an electric vehicle in Vermont is a challenge. And I had to drive to Albany, New York to have my vehicle serviced. Um, so I am doing this in the service of climate change. And uh, it just happened to be that I, I scheduled this about a month and a half ago before uh, we scheduled this meeting today. So I apologize for being on the road and we'll, uh, we'll do my best to walk through your comments and I appreciate your patience with me. Okay, so uh, I've got it up. I don't know if you can see it, but I've got it up now on the screen. So if you can just let me know where you'd like to start. Um, I think let's let's uh, jump ahead to the to the global foundries question. I think that's where most of the comments were, and I think that would be probably be the most useful discussion point in terms of prioritizing our time. Okay. Um, I want to appreciate the the significant feedback we've gotten in comments on the language itself and how it was presented. Um, I think we we like like the building sector said before had a lot of tightening up that we needed to do, and so um, kudos to. Colin Smythe and to Megan O'Toole um, from our team for helping to uh, clarify some of this language so it's it's um, more accurately reflects what the real proposal is um, so that there is clarity for all involved. Um, I think the the big question for um, for uh, this council has been sort of what what is the what is occurring at the Public Utility Commission relative to the Global Foundry's uh, self-managed utility proceeding. And is it, and what is its relationship to the work that we're doing here as part of the Climate Action Plan? Um, and so the, what we've clarified is that that process is ongoing and there is hope amongst those parties who signed the letter of intent that there are, way, that there are going to be ways to, uh, to guarantee emissions reductions um, from Global Foundries and therefore the semiconductor manufacturing sector here in Vermont um, through the course of that proceeding, but it's not guaranteed at this point. And so what, what is presented in the language is a clear distinction that says, um, we, we believe that the opportunity to continue to pursue these reductions through that proceeding has benefits um, but if that if it were not to be able to occur for whatever reason, there is no uh, agreement in place. There's no PUC agreement to that to um, at this point to um, to that process to ensure that we have the regulatory backstop uh, with the Agency of Natural Resources as it exists as part of the Global Warming Solutions Act and our existing authority over uh, air quality in the state. And so I just want to offer that as sort of a broader sort of context for uh, where things stand. Um, and uh, just um, sort of offer that this is not a, this has never been conceived of as a way to uh, exempt or keep global foundries separate and apart from the rest of the work of the rest of the state to reduce emissions. Um, it has always been considered a tool uh, to achieve emissions just as not all re emissions uh, reductions in this package are going to come from um, from ANR driven regulatory proceedings. Uh, the clean heat standard, for example, is con is conceived of as a PUC based proceeding um, and rulemaking process. Um, some of our work is in the sort of investment and weatherization world that is not. Uh, uh, part of a rulemaking package. So the desire was really to present this as a tool or a pathway to achieve our emissions reductions, but not as a separate and apart from or to change the nature of the underlying requirements, especially as it relates to the sectoral emissions discussions that we've had um, with all of you that Jared led um, a few weeks ago around trying to understand how we were going to um, 
apply those the sort of sectoral emissions reductions um, discussion that uh, we've we that was that is included in the Global Warming Solutions Act and an important part of how we how we tackle this work. So I guess I kind of want to open it up for questions at this point to see if this language addresses uh, your concerns and to see what what other um, thoughts the council had. But we did really want to make clear that this was the intent um, and that it just wasn't simply as clear in the in the wording of the of the drafting. And we appreciate the feedback that we got. Thanks, Peter. So you have a, a question already from Chris. Chris, take it away. Hey, thanks, Peter. I just I'm trying to get my head around um, how the PUC would even deal with Global Warming Solutions Act and how who would represent the the cap, the climate action plan once it's adopted. Um, and who would be the who would be the party? I don't know. How would that work? Do we know? Chris, that's a great question. Obviously, there is a lot to work out if this were to occur. But the bottom line is just as we will for the Global Warming Solutions Act direct, directed work. Well, this is Global Warming Solutions Act directed work. If this is part of the cap, then it would be the same thing. We at the Agency of Natural Resources as we do for the other components of in different sectors would would be the verification methodology for this work. That answer your question, Chris? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm at that, no, um, so, no, so we, I'm just trying we, to, figure, I'm just trying to a, figure out, I'm just trying to figure out who, uh, I'm not, I'm just, I'm thinking back to my good over my Yankee days. And, you know, we as a regional commission uh, would engage um, in those dockets. We would certainly reach out like to the, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, public advocate with Department of Public Service, you know, and see where they're at. Um, but of course they ultimately rep represent the rate payers and they have their own position. I'm just trying to figure out how, uh, and frankly, this is a bigger, this is probably a bigger issue than just global foundries. Uh, you know, how does the Global Warming Solution that get represented um, almost independently? Uh, if this is something we can, we can deal with later. I was just was trying to figure out what that looked like exactly. And, and I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it. It's just, uh, it, but it is a, it is a consequential uh, yeah, it does have consequence. So, so I, I agree with you that it has consequences. I guess maybe I wasn't clear. The Agency of Natural Resources, the Global Warming Solutions Act ultimate authority lies with the Agency of Natural Resources. In the event that we fail to have an action plan, we're the ones held responsible through potential litigation. It, we, we would take that responsibility in front of the PUC to advocate for those emissions reductions. I, yeah, I, Peter, I guess I'm just trying to figure out to what extent would, um, to what extent would, would DEC uh, be on the same page as the other state agencies that might participate in that docket? Um, and is it possible that there would be other, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, yeah, just how that, how that would all work or, or would, would they all have to be kind of of one accord um we can feel what we can do with it later i just I, um i don't want to take up more time on it i see june's hands going up i think she probably has something to contribute on this yeah uh need to unmute mute i don't see your mute button on but i can't hear you sorry right. yeah. can you hear me now yep. okay sorry no, i apologize for driving uh, very much. Uh, Chris, I, I appreciate the question and I'm not sure I can answer it, you know, off the top of my head, but I think there's a distinction between representing the council and the Global Warming Solutions Act and the products, the things that derive from it, such as this plan. Uh, this plan, um, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it is in one way or another effectively law or the regulations that get uh, adopted based on it become law. And I think 
Peter has correctly pointed out that to the extent those regulations are within the purview of the ANR, uh, they would be the enforcement authority for it directly. To the extent that it informs the PUC proceeding, it belongs to the body of law that the state is responsible for enforcing and carrying forward. And then that very much becomes a function of either uh, ANR representation through intervention in PUC proceedings or possibly the public advocate as well, as well depending on the issue. And um, you know, it's, it's like in most other cases, the state agencies uh, have to work out you know, how they work together in a case or, or not. Um, so I, I hope that helps a little bit, but, but the, the panel itself, um, it's unclear to me whether it has a, a separate legal existence for things like prosecutions and the like, uh, you know, beyond putting together this, this um, plan and then doing the iterative work afterwards, specifically the, the outreach we've been talking about and the refinements. So I, I hope that gives you some comfort. You know, it helps. I appreciate it. Sorry, I don't, sorry to take up too much time on this. No, I don't think you're taking up time. I think you're raising a point that we just haven't you know, thought through. It's, it's, it's a good point. It doesn't sound like, Chris, you're asking for this to be specifically highlighted in the draft itself. It's just a clarification in terms of implementation. Right, just the mechanics yeah. of how that would work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Jared. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I would be interested in and defer to others who've looked at this more carefully, but one immediate suggestion that jumps out to me based on Peter's introduction and then looking at this text that we see right now on the screen <clears throat> would be in line 134 after the word limits to say consistent with GWSA requirements. I think one of the things that we want, that, that I have heard consistently uh, brought up as a concern is that it's not just about being able to reduce emissions, but consistent with the 2025-2030 targets. I think interpretation of what consistent with GWSA requirements means, uh, I think there is a question there, right? Because is it just by sector and the sectoral proportionality we've talked about, you know, using that 2018 baseline? Or as I've heard Peter describe before, are we looking at the overall emissions of global foundries as a facility, not just the process emissions, but also the thermal emissions and the emissions from electricity and making sure that as a whole, those emissions would decline um, uh, along the lines outlined by uh, the, the uh, kind of target year requirements in the Global Warming Solutions Act. And I think that clarity um, is in like lines 131, 133, but then it gets dropped in 134. And, there may be other issues that I'm not catching, but immediately just what's in front of me, I think that that would help add additional clarity if we said uh, after the word limits there in line with uh, Global Warming Solutions Act requirements going on to line 135, just to keep that clarity and consistency. I think that's a great edit and I'm happy to add it. Great. All right. Um... Any other comments on the Global Foundries section as drafted? All right. So Peter, was, it, was there anything else within the, uh, I, I know there were some comments around um, the other pathway, which was the, um, I know you made some changes to reflect. Yeah, there was a, there was a substantive pathway from uh, my very attentive boss who, uh, had an order of operations question around how we were doing the refrigerant management plan yeah. uh, because we had sort of high level things laid out at the beginning and then kind of more process below. We've adjusted that to more reflect sort of kind of a la clean heat standard, kind of what's the timeline look like? How do we, how do we get from here to there? Um, and so I think we've done that well. And I can speak to Julie offline to see if, if that's met her needs, but I think it probably has just to make clear that there's there's some study and some 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 work to, to do before adopting a refrigerant management plan. I'm I'm comfortable with the edits that have been made. Thank you. Great, great. All right. With that, if there aren't any other things that you want to bring up, Peter, then I'll just give turn it back to the council to see if there's anything else overall in the non-energy section that you have remaining questions about. Yeah, Lauren. 
I guess I want to voice support for Jared's proposed edit. In the absence of that, I am very confused why ANR would set limits when the emissions reductions limits are already set in statute via the Global Warming Solutions Act. So if that's done, um, that would be really helpful for me in understanding what it was that I'm signing off on in a couple of weeks' time. Um, hearing, hearing the words or phrases hope and may not meet are obviously rather concerning. And, and Peter, if you're uh, hearing me from your car, um, I heard on VPR this morning that the MOU deadline that was Monday to be reached between Global Foundries, uh, ANR and PSD was not met. And I just wonder what the implications of continued conversations in those proceedings would mean for moving forward to that second um, that second phrase that Jared just recommended we change it to. Sure, I, I, I think the, the language could be clarified to be clear that the ANR developing emissions limits is a rulemaking process to implement that those requirements, those required reductions as contemplated by the Global Warming Solutions Act. So again, I think it's, it's a clarification and I'm happy to do that. Um, the, the, as you're right, the deadline hasn't been met, but that doesn't mean that the conversations aren't still going on. Um, it, I wouldn't say that they are to the point yet where we're ready to move to phase two, which is, I guess, why I'm sort of the, or the, the backup plan of ANR rulemaking. So, which is why I'm, uh, asking this council to endorse us to continue to have those conversations. And if they can, if they lead to those required emissions reductions, then uh, we, we would proceed in that manner. If not, then we're, we're very clear that ANR would establish emissions limits consistent with the Global Warming Solutions Act through rulemaking. Is that, it, it, yeah. I, 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 will, I will work, I am happy to work with both Lauren and with Jared to, to make sure that that sentence makes sense. But it sounds like you're on board with the intent of strengthening it. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm very much on, on board with the intent of making precisely clear what we mean by those words. Okay, great. Because they're important. Joey. Um, I just wanted to appreciate that. And I will defer to you working with Lauren and Jared because I, I wanted to sort of raise similar questions slash potential concerns. Um, and I just added in the chat here a bit ago that I'd love to the degree possible to get the dates embedded in there. Um, and we'll look forward to the dates that the GWSA um, is focused around. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing that language when you have time, Peter. I mean, I just, I think that this is an important issue. It's obviously, as we know, challenging timing, but I think, you know, we're talking about 8% of Vermont's electricity load and potentially removing, removing that from the res and just wanting to make sure that we are um, to the degree um, that we are actually um, being clear about what we ask of them. So thanks. Peter, maybe this was clear to you, but I, I just want to make sure it is. When you say, Joey, that you want to be sure that there's a reference to the dates that the GWSA, yes. what, what are you? The 2025, 2030, and 2050 targets embedded. Target. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Requirements. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Um, okay. Any additional comments on this? All right, Peter, thank you. Um, so and I guess I have a clarification, Joey, because that's in terms of which, where you want those to appear. I had, um, was, I was glomming on, sorry, Peter, to um, following up at, on Jarrett's comment on line 134. He had recommended some specific language, produce sufficient reductions in line um, with the Global Warming Solutions Act and the 2025, 2030, and 2050 pollution reduction requirements or so something like I, that. I guess I would say that that is the implication of all of the rulemaking that we're conducting under the Global Warming Solutions Act, that they would set requirements for all of those dates. So unless it just, it feels, at some point we put all of the words down on paper 
that mean that, that they're consistent, right? That those requirements are there. They're the Global Warming Solutions Act requirements. They're the 2025, the 2030, and 2050 dates. I think we start to make sentences that have so many <laughs> words in them that they're hard to understand what they mean. But I, I, I appreciate well, what you mean, and I'm happy to uh, take a crack at it. That would be great. I mean, this is, this is a big deal. I think we want to be sensitive to how we approach it. And yeah, I would love to see, again, the words on the page. So thank you as a team for doing that work. Right. I am going to stop sharing at this point. And um, let me see where we are in terms of time. I think the what we had planned uh, at 345, so about or before 345 was to, and the public comment was to try to see if there was anything that uh, the council felt like you've covered in the recent uh, meetings that you've have, has yet has not been adequately covered. You haven't had a chance to bring up, uh, not to revisit the things that you've already discussed that are going to be taken on in terms of the next revision uh, with specific changes, but anything that absolutely has not been discussed and has not been considered that still needs to be on the table. Going once, going twice. All right, up, oh, Jared. I think this falls in the cat in this category, and it, but it's 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 more about a, a framing and a response to a really important question yesterday that. Um, Secretary Tebbets raised, and I don't know if he is on um, still, but he, he raised the important question about kind of what are the implications of the recommendations in the cap in terms of public investment. Um, and, you know, I think that we have some analysis that points to that on some recommendations. We have other forthcoming analysis that will look at that more deeply. And I would not, um, you know, I would not speak for you know, the, the resilience adaptation subcommittees I am not on, but I do feel confident in speaking to the analysis that has been done around the mitigation recommendations that there are actually, you know, when we look at the main recommendations there, they do not have large implications for um, new public funding. Specifically, the two largest uh, planks in terms of uh, projected emissions reduction with the clean heat standard and the transportation and climate initiative would be requirements placed on fossil fuel suppliers and would end up through market mechanisms becoming self-funding programs. I mean, they would there, there would likely need to be government support in terms of you know, implementation and oversight at agencies and, and departments. Uh, similarly, the clean cars uh, standard, uh, cl uh, clean cars, advanced clean cars too, and it, uh, the clean trucks recommendation, those are requirements on auto manufacturers um, that, you know, there, there may be work at VTrans or ANR um, that is ab about compliance with those. But I think a num there are some recommendations that certainly do implicate public funding. Weatherization at scale is one of them. Uh, charging uh, infrastructure build out is is one of them, but I think that there are clearly existing federal sources and some of the new uh, recommendations that are being put forward, especially around clean heat standard and TCI would provide revenue sources going forward. So I just, I think that's an important question. I want to address it because I didn't think it got addressed um, sufficiently yesterday, but I don't, I, I think it would be uh, inaccurate to have an assumption that the, at least on the mitigation side, that those recommendations are likely to lead to significant um, uh, um, kind of calling upon uh, existing state funds. I think more analysis needs to be done, but I think the, the big ticket items that we're looking at in terms of the modeling, it is important to understand how those would be funded and, and the role of um, kind of you know, the, the, the market overall. Um, I think there's more to say there, but I just, I just wanted to briefly um, address that because I think it was an important question. 
Thanks, Jared. Um, so I don't know if the individual you said that brought that up yesterday is on or wants to respond or has any additional input on that or any of the other counselors, but I'll just leave that open for reactions. Uh, thanks, it's, it's Anson. I, I'm on, but uh, that's important. Thank you, Jared, for that, that feedback. Okay. Well, great. Well, then um, it sounds like we've wrapped up uh, the two main remaining sections of the cap. We've also heard, uh, gotten the overview of the climate uh, impacts assessment and projections section that we'll, you'll need to provide comments on um, by Friday. Um, and so the next steps, just as a reminder, is that the uh, authors, uh, and there's typically been teams of authors that have been working on these sections, will take these remaining comments that they've, they've heard, and I've been tracking uh, on the side here, and address them to the extent that they need you directly to provide them with input on specific wording. Um, I'm assuming that they will reach out to you or you will reach out to them if it's important that you get specific wording included. Um, but that is the process that, and again, the expectation is that much of this can be concluded by, much of this in revised language can be concluded by Friday so that it can be incorporated and turned around in a, in a new draft pr provided to the council by next Tuesday in preparation for your meetings next week. Jane. Can I, I just add on something? Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so I just, I will be sharing an email um, with you all um, later this evening, but all of the documents um, are now posted minus one subcommittee's revisions. Um, but those are coming in shortly, I understand. And so want you to all know that all the documents for your review for next Tuesday um, are now posted um, or will be within the next hour or so. Um, so those are all there. Um, those are the final piece, outstanding pieces besides the executive summary of the CAP. So all pieces are now completed for the CAP, um, except for all the revisions to the individual sections that need to be made. Um, our hope and anticipation is to have that comprehensive draft posted ahead of the meeting um, on Tuesday of next week so that the whole um, CAP as one document is posted at that time. So I hope and trust that as all of you are working through your revisions, um, we'd like to ask and request, unless there are extraordinary circumstances, that we could have those revised documents by Monday of next week. I know there's been some wiggle room as of late to get them Tuesday um, and Wednesday morning even. So if we can have all revised documents by Monday, that would be great and let us have that draft out for Tuesday for review. So thank you for that. Well, thanks for the clarification. And uh, Richard is Richard Hoppins is asking, where, where are they posted? Is it going to be in the resources? Is it going to be on the with the meeting. Marion just kindly put it all in the chat as I was oh, talking, which is great. And great. as I've been doing to make it easier for you all, in addition to having them on the in the website where Marion has linked in the chat, I'll also attach them to the email that I send later today um, so that you also don't have to go finding them all. Great, great. All right, let's go to public comment. Um, and I, uh, I know m many of you are, are very familiar with the process, but please do use your raise hand function because that's the best way for me to see who is, who is in line to make a comment. And um, we have two, two folks, Annette Smith and Matt Kola, if you wanna, Coda, wanna, wanna, uh, Annette, do you wanna start off with public comments? Yes, thank you. I'm gonna make a comment that probably won't be very popular, but then I don't know that any of my comments have made any difference. So I started reading the documents that have been posted and a lot of what I deal with in my work is often the result of backlash. And in reading sort of the framing and the tone of what I'm seeing coming out of this council, I'm concerned that it has a feeling of very top-down, heavy-handed, I, I keep thinking about Vermonters being independent 
and frugal. And somehow none of that seems to be really reflected in the work that you're doing. And it concerns me because I, I appreciate backlash happens when people overreach. And it's often the reason that I end up having to get involved in things. So I just want to offer that as a, a sort of a, a way of suggesting that you put in some framing that recognizes that what is being recommended here is something that I mean, I don't even know how to how to suggest that you say it, but I do think that the way that this is being written feels very much like, you know, somebody sitting in a, a, an ivory tower somewhere telling the peons down below, this is what you have to do. And I don't know that that's going to play well with a, a certain segment of the population. So I offer that for what it's worth. Thank you. And I appreciate all that you're doing and all that you have to do in a short period of time. And I have no idea how this is all gonna to come together or even how I'm gonna have time to read the full document before you even vote on it. So good luck. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, Matt Coda. Hi, thank you. My name is Matt Coda. I run the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association. Uh, but what I mostly do is train heating technicians. If someone's been in your basement to install or repair a boiler or furnace, they went to my school and they have their wallet card from the Department of Public Safety and they can't work in a public building according to the fire code without having that wallet, having that wallet card. They can work in single family homes without having any training at all because there's no code enforcement. There is no residential building energy code enforcement in Vermont. Um, so when I see the recommendation that says we need to update the statewide residential building energy code, Yes, you can update the RBs and CBs. Yes, you can enforce it in Act 250 developments. Outside of Burlington, there is no code enforcement. There is no code. So in order to do that, you would need authorizing legislation to empower the Department of Public Safety, Division of Fire Safety, to update the building and fire code to include single family owner occupied homes. And of course, to staff up what would need be significantly staff up in order to enforce that code. Um, so I just wanna bring that to your attention. Uh, the second thing, uh, as I look at what you have on the webpage for Tuesday regarding what actions are ready for rule order, I just wanna say TCIP, whether you like it or not, it's a tax, it's a fee, has to go through the legislature, not ready for rulemaking. Once the legislature gives the approval, the governor signs, or Governor vetoes and it's overridden the legislature, then it's ready for rule, but not before. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, and it looks like our last comment comes from Chase Whiting. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on the proposed pathway pertaining to um, the semiconductor manufacturing um, emissions. And uh, just note that, um, the pathway doesn't identify specific data um, about the greenhouse gas emissions that could be achieved in the manufacturing sector. And um, that lack of specificity becomes important because the pathway is discussing uh, an underlying PUC proceeding in which um, Global Foundries is asking for exemption from Vermont's renewable energy standard and efficiency requirements. Uh, both of which are among Vermont's most important and effective uh, mechanisms and statutes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, the specific data about how many emissions or how many greenhouse gas emissions, uh, how much greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced in manufacturing becomes really important because if we are going to look at the overall emissions reductions, as Commissioner Walk uh, has noted and is uh, Jared Duvall noted too in his comment a moment ago, um, it needs to be done in relation to the likely emissions increases from removing so much of Vermont's electricity load, in this case about 8% um, from the renewable energy standard and, uh, and, and removing that, that large company from Vermont's efficiency requirements as well. And so without that data, without a specific plan um, requiring specific amounts of greenhouse gas emissions in manufacturing, 
sufficient enough to uh, be greater than the likely emissions increases because of electricity, the result is that this pathway could very well lead to an emissions increase in Vermont. Um, and that increase would then um, be something that the rest of Vermonters would need to bear the burden of and reduce their own emissions even more to make up for the increased emissions um, uh, that would be, be permitted to occur. So um, I, CLF, for whom I work, um, filed public comments last week. They're, through, they're available in the public comment portal and um, were emailed to each of the Climate Council members. These points are made more specifically there um, and I'd encourage uh, Climate Council members, if you have the time, I know you're ex exceptionally busy right now, but to take a look and um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk through any of those finer points um, and would just urge that the pathway be uh, amended to include specific greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements by specific dates so that there's something that folks can rely on to know that the pathway is either going to achieve the goals it says it will, or we'll know up front that, uh, that it's not capable of doing so. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. And um, Steve Crowley. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, great uh, discussion. You guys are doing such tremendous work in general. Uh, so I really appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, I wanna make a comment that relates to the challenge of scaling up that was discussed in a couple of different sectors. And it came up today, um, you know, whether you're talking about the, you know, tripling, quadrupling the amount of electricity that we're gonna need or the weatherization and, and so many other areas, uh, it is such a challenge to scale up. And, and I think I heard the comment today that, uh, the existing institutions, existing uh, uh, ways we have of dealing with this today aren't gonna measure up. Um, there's a lot of great discussion about workforce development too. And I think that's super important, the tech centers and, and uh, you know, providing opportunities for people. Well, I'd like to just suggest that, that in addition to that thinking, um, it might be a great opportunity to uh, provide support for small businesses, new small businesses, developing the ability to engage in these areas. Uh, I think that's a huge uh, opportunity to fill a gap. Uh, and uh, um, I, I know that some of these programs already operate through the use of small businesses, but I think that could be expanded a lot. Um, you know, with things like uh, 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 special financing programs or mentorships or special training in, in managing and entrepreneurship in general. So I think those, in addition to just workforce development, uh, small business development is another important area. And I guess I'd also like to point out that in my view, this provides an important equity opportunity also, where a lot of people who have uh, been challenged uh, financially, maybe through generations, um, don't feel they have the capacity to engage in a small business, but then maybe they do have the capacity. And with some training and with mentorship, um, it's possible to make opportunities available that are beyond what's available just as a member of the workforce working for wage uh, wages. If you can have the opportunity to um, take a leap in your life, I believe that there are a great many people who would be in that um uh, you know, economically marginal category who could really uh, benefit in their own lives and bring a lot more to their communities through the development of small businesses. So those of you who are thinking about that, uh, bringing it to scale uh, might include some thinking about that too. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, and I just wanna say, I know that, you know, these meetings have not had a lot of opportunity for back and forth interaction in the public comments because of just the sheer volume of work that has to get done in all this, uh, in each of these meetings. But I, I, you know, my work with the cross sector mitigation, I know that um, the council members and the subcommittee members have really valued the public input they've gotten throughout the process, um, both here and at the subcommittee levels. Um, I see that Jane has left, and I know that uh, the last item is just to, a reminder of, of our schedule. Uh, she hit the high points on that before she had to go. Marion, is there anything you wanted to add about uh, next steps? 
No, I think Jane covered it. Um, I posted the links in the chat to where both documents for review for next week uh, that you all haven't seen yet, as well as a link to the resources table where, um, as was noted in the chat, all documents once uh, reviewed are being posted with the track changes that incorporate the edits that you all provided through the survey and through council feedback. So those are both linked there and feel free to reach out if you are looking for something and can't find it. I'm happy to help point you in the right direction. Um, and beyond that, we have our meeting next week, um, but, but Jane covered it all in her overview earlier. All right. All right, well, thank you. Um, so with that, I believe we're adjourned for today and um, appreciate all the time and attention you've given to this yet again. So um, have, a, have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everybody.